Have you found Romans chapter 7? Yes. In this church, I would imagine you know where it is. <laughs> All right. A few giggles, and that means I've hit the right chord. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. Let's read verses 1 through 6 for our text today. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, Verse 4, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Under the terms of the benefits and the privileges of the new covenant, the believer has to understand where the law fits into our relationship with Christ. What role did it play? What role does it play after we're born again? Where do we place the law? Most of those who oppose the message of the cross or that don't really understand the message of the cross don't understand what to do with the law. Because it seems entirely wrong, and it is, to say that the law is no more and then take a look at it and say it doesn't matter now what I do. And they think when we preach that we're living under grace and not under law that we're encouraging the believer and look. In, in evil, in just licentiousness, in <coughs> licentiousness, by just allowing us to do whatever we think we want to do because we're now no longer under law. And nothing could be further from the truth. Because to be honest with you, as we'll try to bring out today in our message, to be under grace is a far more restrictive measure than law ever could have been. Right. It's a far more demanding means, uh, and it's a far more demanding master than law ever could be. But we're comfortable with law because we know it. And it ministers to our ego. It helps us feel important when we do something. And that's what law and works always does. It causes us to have faith in ourselves and we miss having faith in Christ. So if we don't understand the law, if we don't understand what it's there for, if we don't understand what relationship, if any, that we are to have with it, then we become confused. And we either become legalistic, trying to keep the law, or we can become uh, a church of license, as the great grace movement is going on right now. Not great in its content, but it's great in the number of people that are accepting it. And we need to be very careful because it's telling us that it doesn't matter how we live and what we do. Let me say this before we pray. Your faith in Christ and the cross itself affects a position and has the opportunity to affect your condition. When you're born again, when you come to Christ, you are considered the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's a fact. God imputes to you, and this is a position, He imputes to you the righteousness of Christ. You have that, and your faith has established that. But when we stop there, we, we miss it, because God doesn't just expect that our position is where we stop. He wants to affect not only our position, where He can have a relationship with us, but He wants to affect our condition. How we think, how we act, where we go, what we do. And he doesn't do that through the means of law. He does that through the means of faith and grace. And when we come to understand that, then the law will not be a confusing element for us. 
We won't go to either side of the spectrum and go either to self-righteousness and legalism, neither will we go to licentiousness and freedom from any law, or antinomianism as it's called, freedom from any kind whatsoever. Instead, we'll center ourselves in Christ, find the freedom from the law and the power to live holy. Amen? Amen. So let's pray and let's work with this. What shall we do with the law. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to minister this morning. I thank you for every person that has come, every person that has walked into the service today. Lord, we pray that there would be open hearts and open minds to receive what the Word has to say to us. And Father, guide me, Lord, in this subject, in this matter. Let the true teacher come. Let the true preacher come. The one that makes teaching and preaching easy. And Father, anoint the people to hear. Let them grasp the truth that sets them free. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. And amen. amen. <coughs> Romans chapter seven, 7 is centered right in the middle of the great subject of sanctification for the believer. The subject of sanctification is the subject of how we are to affect our condition or how we are to live out our Christian experience as believers in this world. Chapters 4 and 5 really of justification and justification deals with our position. But chapters 6, 7, and 8 deal with our condition. In chapter 6 we find out, and I know that if you've been here any amount of time and you're not a visitor here this morning, you know that chapter 6 deals with the truth that our faith in Christ and the cross frees us from the relationship that we once had with the sin nature. And so we're freed from that as a result of faith in Christ. But then we're exhorted to maintain our freedom from the sin nature. Again, the sin nature in simplistic form, in a simplistic view, is that nature that man is born with. Man is not born intrinsically good. Man is born a sinner. Thanks to the fall, and our heart is darkened, our heart is blackened, and that's by sin. And each one of us, no matter where we come from, no matter how good our background is, no matter how good our family is that we come from, each of us have to deal with the truth that we were born, as David said, in sin. And the an answer for that is to accept Christ as our Savior and let Him come in and give us freedom from the penalty for our sin, and then He breaks the power of the sin nature that really it's that nature that moves us and motivates us towards sin. Well, if you can get rid of the root then you can eliminate the flower. I said if you can get rid of the root, then you can eliminate the flower. The church today is cutting off flowers, but it's kind of like chopping off dandelions every time that you go ahead and mow your lawn. You know what? They're coming right back because the root wasn't taken care of. But Romans chapter 6 tells us that the root was taken care of, and it was taken care of by faith. And then now we're to live free from that influence, even though it still abides in us. We're to live free from that influence by faith and by grace. Now, I know I just covered three weeks of teaching in about two minutes, but you understand where we are this morning when we talk Amen. about Romans 6. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So... Romans 8 then deals with the power of the Holy Spirit released for sanctification, released for the ongoing growth of the believer. And chapter 7 then sits right in the center. And many people have misunderstood Romans 7. They said Romans 7 is all about Paul looking back at his former life. No, no, no. Romans 7 is a warning to the believer who's been born again not to have a relationship with law as the means of righteousness. Now let me say that again. Romans 7 is positioned perfectly by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. And its entire purpose is to show us that if we want our condition to rise up to our position, that we must not maintain a relationship with law as the means, as the way of righteousness, as a way of changing our condition. Because that's not God's choice. And Paul says to us in this chapter that after he was born again, after he was saved, he made the mistake of 
trying to live for God by means of the law. And he found all the negative consequences of that, and he wrote it down in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is Paul saying, I don't do this, been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the scars to prove it. And so it's not a, a, a dissertation on Paul's former life. It was about Paul as a Christian not knowing how to live for God and attempting to do it by law. So Romans Romans 7 teaches us that we're not to have a relationship with law. And you might say today, well, Brother Larson, I don't have any relationship with the law. Let's look at that a little closer. Let's take a look at our text. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Now, you can't get saved in any century and not come face to face with the Mosaic Law. That is an impossibility. Amen. You can't. It's an impossibility. Even in the first century, when Gentiles got saved, the first problem that they had was knowing what to do with the law and knowing how to deal with the Gentiles. So the minute that you get saved, somebody's going to introduce you to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How long was it? before you picked up a Bible, when somebody said, you ought to read through the Old Testament. You came face to face with the law. The evidence that the early church came face to face with the law, well, first of all, we can take a look at Romans 14, and we find in this church in Rome that was part Gentile and part Jew, that they were arguing about things such as dietary laws that were in the law, and there's such thing as days of worship, because they just didn't know what to do with the law. They were confused because God said in the Old Covenant, this is what I want you to do. And so now we look at that and we say, well, do I do that now? See, that's, the, that's really where the confusion comes in. What do I do with this law? You, you, don't, you don't have to live for Jesus long before you come face to face with that dilemma. And there's not anyone that hasn't had to deal with it. The book of Galatians, which I think is Paul's very first epistle, probably written in A.D. 47, uh, is addressing this very issue because the Jews, known as Judaizers, came along to his new converts and tried to make them keep the law. So you can't get saved and not come face to face with the law. Somebody shout amen. amen. And so if you come face to face with the law, the next thing is you need to understand what the law is for. You will need to understand how it impacts you. And here's another thing. You're used to law. If you're a Jew, not many of you here would be, but if you were a Jew, you were raised under the guidance of the law of Moses. By the time you were 12 years old as a young man, you had to memorize the book of Leviticus. Memorize it. Some of us haven't even read it. <laughs> And so you had to memorize it. Um, if you were a non-Jew, if you were a Gentile, you were raised under law, but they weren't the law of Moses, they were the laws of your society. And it, ver it varied from location to location. But here's the idea. If you do what we say is right, you're a good person. And if you do what we say is wrong, you're a bad person. It doesn't matter what society you come from, that's what you were raised up under. You do the right thing, you're a good girl. You do the wrong thing, you're a bad girl. Amen. You do the right thing, you're a good guy. You do the wrong thing, you're a bad guy. And that, my friend, is righteousness by works. Amen. That's what you were trained to think. You were thinking, if I do the right thing, if I act the right way, even if it's not really how I feel, or as long as people don't find out what I really do, they'll still think of me as right. They'll still think of me as an okay guy. They'll still think of me as... See, and that's how we've evaluated ourselves in all of society. If we do what pleases the society that we live in, then again, we are righteous. We're a good person. And we've evaluated ourselves based on that. That, my friend, is righteousness by the law. So no matter where you grew up, no matter what age you lived in, when you are, come as a Christian, one of the things that you have to account or one of the things that you have to realize is that you were born under the law. You were born subject to law. You thought that law was your means to righteousness. 
You did good and you're right. You see it? That's what your faith is in. You've been trained this way. You've been taught this. You've been uh, pushed. You. This has been pushed on you. Now, some people come and they say, listen, I don't think that, well, let me, let me go one other step. We also learn from the Bible that if you don't get saved in this lifetime, that you're going to be judged by the law of God. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior now, you're going to stand before God. And one violation of the Word of God, one violation in thought or deed from the time that you were born to the time that you die or that Christ returns, one violation, one wrong thought is enough to forever censor you from heaven and place you into the lake of fire for eternity. One wrong thought. You're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 by the law. Why? Because you're under the law. Amen. If you're not saved this morning, you're still under the law. Right. It will accuse you. Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I didn't come to accuse you. He didn't. He came to save. But he said, there's one that does accuse you, even in that one in which you trust. And he was referring to this judgment. When they stand before God and tell him all the good things that they've done, he's going to open up the book of their lives and expose every thought, every deed. And all he has to do is come up with one variant, one deviant from his law. And he separates that man or woman, boy or girl forever from his presence. And ladies and gentlemen, you do not want to get what you deserve. Right, amen. amen. You do not want to be judged by the law. Because there's no person that has ever been able to stand before God and say, I'm perfect, but one. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Only amen. one man ever lived perfect and kept the law to its fullness, kept the law in both attitude and action. But before you're born again, you are under the law and you will be subject to the law and its righteous demands and its penalty. Now, if you accept Christ as your Savior, the penalty, and we usually get this really quick, the penalty that was once applied to you through the law is eliminated. Yes. You accept Christ because on Calvary, when he died on the cross... He paid the penalty for every sin, for every human being that would ever live and every deed and every thought that was ever anti-God or not lining up with God's word. He paid the price for that. He didn't ask you to pay it. He paid it. He paid the penalty for my sin and yours. For everyone that was born all the way back to Abel uh, and, and Cain and everyone that will be born until the end of the age. On the cross, he paid the penalty for every single, every single action. But on the cross, he also did just, he broke the power of sin's grip over us, paid the penalty, broke the power, but our union with Christ, simply by faith, set us free, listen, from the authority of the law, not just its penalty. Yeah. It set us free from the authority of the law. Yeah. We have been translated out of a kingdom of darkness that will be dominated and judged by law into the kingdom of God's dear son which will be judged and ongoingly changed that's not the way to say it it consistently changed not by law but by grace and faith I'm in a new kingdom I'm in a new system I'm no longer under the law I'm under grace yeah. if I've accepted Christ I'm no longer under law but I'm under grace yeah. now this is a good thing because the law, listen to me, the law could never supply humankind with the ability to change my condition. Right. Neither did it ever have the ability to give me a position. Why? Because I couldn't keep it. Yeah. That's right. Think about it. God reveals himself through the law. To humanity. It was needful because God had never revealed himself to humanity in this way before. Never. When 
when the children of Israel were birthed, incubated in Egypt, and then delivered some 400 years, 450 years after, he brought them after three months to Mount Sinai, where they parked for a year and a month. And for a year and a month, God, through the ministry of angels and Moses, gave them what we refer to now as the Mosaic Law. In that law was God's revelation of himself, something never given. And in that revelation, he taught three major things, three major issues. He taught moral code. He said, this is right and this is wrong. Now, God could not write everything that he thought was wrong down. But he chose ten that feature morality of man and relationship with God. But there were more than ten commandments that talked about moral code. There was a civil law that taught how we ought to treat one another. And the penalty for not treating each other right. And there was a ceremonial law where God revealed to humankind a form of worship. And that was done at the tabernacle. In the building of the tabernacle, God revealed his redemption plan because there's not one piece of that tabernacle down to the silver nails that did not point to Christ. Amen. Not one point of it. So listen, God was revealing himself for the first time relative to morality, relative to civil relationship, one with another, and relative... To worship. Uh, the, the tabernacle, later the type of the temple. Uh, this is beautiful. You can see it. You know it. You walk in to the area of the tabernacle. What's the first thing that you see? You see the brazen altar. What's the brazen altar? It's a type of the cross, the sacrifice. And once you get past that, once you appropriate the sacrifice, you can go into the holy place. What's that? Well, the priest could on the right side of the holy place, there was the show, table of showbread, a type of God's word, a type of sustenance. On the left side, where there was the menorah, the seven branch candlestick, a type of revelation and insight. And right before you, before the holy of holies, was the altar of incense. What's that worship? So here's what God started to reveal. You get the cross, you get the altar, and then you can have bread from heaven, you can have revelation, and you can enter into insight and worship yeah. and praise. Yeah. Yeah. See, he began to give insight to himself. He began to give you revelation. And then, once a year, the great high priest could travel into the tabernacle, into the holy of holies, where the presence of God dwelt. So watch what God gives them in the first uh, year and a half, or a year and a month. Really, a year and a half. He gives him the tabernacle and he says, this is representative of my redemption plan. Here's the sacrifice. Here's the word. Here's revelation. Here's worship. And there's my presence. That's what I want to bring to you. But it was all imperfect. It was all in type. It was the law held shadows of what was to come. It was setting us up. See, God's revelation of himself has been progressive. A little bit here, line upon line, precept upon precept. He couldn't put it all on us. So for the first 4,000 years, the best they had was the Old Testament revelation of Christ and God's redemption plan progressively revealed through the law and through the prophets. Are you getting that? So the progressive revelation of the law not only held man in check uh, in the sense of what guilt was and what was wrong, but it also began to be a revelation of God. God spelled out right and wrong and said, this is wrong, this is right. And the world needs today that revelation of what God says is right and what God says is wrong. We live in a society today that's so confused we don't even know what bathroom to use. Amen. How we got here, we're laughing but I'm crying. How did we arrive in that? How did we arrive to that condition? We ignore the revealed will of God as given under the law. The law shows us what's right and what's wrong. But what the law 
could not do is that the law could not save us. It couldn't give us a position of righteousness because we couldn't keep it. Amen. But it was God's revelation of himself to humanity. And God spoke through the law about morality, about how we treat one another, how we were to worship. It's God's first revelation to man of himself. It's a limited revelation. It doesn't have the power that you have available to you today. But it, it, had, uh, it was a place to start. you got to start somewhere. Before the kid can read, you got to teach him ABCs. The law was God's ABC of himself to humanity. Amen. Are, are you seeing it? And the law always prophesied that there would be a redeemer that would come. Amen. So all of us are born accountable to this law, under this law, going to be judged by this law. But when we came to Christ... Paul says something here, and I want you to see it with me in our text. Paul says that when we came to Christ, we were freed from the law. And in order to, well, let me, let me back up, make sure I didn't miss something here. Yes, we were freed from the law, but so you're going to know the law. doesn't matter who you are. You're going to know the law and in one form or another. You're going to understand what righteousness by the law. And that law that we come into contact with as a human being has dominion over us as long as we live. You see it? We are coming into contact with the law, how that the law has... Now here's what he starts to tell to believers. How that the law has dominion, you are subject, you are accountable to the righteous demands of the law. You are subject to its penalties as long as you live. And then he breaks off into an illustration that sometimes is greatly misunderstood in verses 2 and 3. Carry here, travel this. I'm going to give you this real simple and then we'll go through it. Get these three words. Death, changes, relationship. Okay, you got that? Say it with me. Death, changes, relationship. This is all that verses 2 and 3 teach. Death, changes, relationship. Now watch. In verse 2, for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So first illustration, we have a woman that's married. And according to the laws of the land, she is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if that husband is dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. She's no longer accountable to him. She no longer has to answer to him because death is changes relationship death changes relationship all right you getting that thought yes. now look at the second illustration verse three whatever you do don't try to combine these as one illustration because it'll mess up your head it doesn't work it wasn't paul's intention look at verse three so then if while her husband lives see brand new illustration now we have one wife and her husband who has not died he's alive <laughs> Right? So as her husband is alive, and while he is alive, she sneaks off and gets married to another man and is now called an adulteress. Now you need to get this. It, it, she's not dealing with a dead husband. She's just saying, honey, you ain't got what it takes to meet all my need. So I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to go get me a second husband. Foolish woman. <laughs> you can't do that. It don't work. Okay. Ladies, how many of you think your husband would go along with the idea of you being gone half the week? Any fellows here stupid enough to say yes to that? <laughs> not me. I'm not. I, I love my wife, but I'm jealous. I'm not going to share her with anybody. Not in that respect. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You can look, but don't touch. <laughs> Amen, Brother Larson. Preach on, Brother Larson. That's exactly right. Because that's right. But if a person is married to one person, and she goes off and marries another, now she's trying to gain the benefit of both, and God says that's not right. Now, watch this then. 
When we're married to one and we then make a commitment to a second, that makes us an adulteress. Simple enough. Now look at the rest of the illustration. But if, uh, she says, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no more adulterous though she be married to another man. So the illustration, the second one says, if you want to be married to another man, there has to be a death. Amen. And then you're free for the second marriage. Now, let me get this to you. Your first marriage was a marriage to law. You were born under law. Now, I'm going to ask you to help me. We're going to go to Galatians chapter uh, 3, please. And I'll prove this to you. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. I'd like you to put on the screen verses 23, 24, and 25. Because I want to prove to you that before you were born again, before you were saved, you were under the law. All right? Watch this. But before faith came, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, we were kept where? Where? So before faith came, before you accepted Christ, where were you kept? Who was your husband? The law. And what did the law demand? Righteousness. And if you didn't keep it, what did the law give you? Penalty. You were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Next verse, please. Wherefore, here's the law. Here's the purpose of the law. The law is a schoolmaster, a guide to do what? To bring us to Christ. The law shows us what God says is right, and the law reveals to us that we can't keep it. Your own lives prove it, whether you admit it or not. That's right, amen. Again, if you live under law all your life and you stand before God one day, He's going to find at least one attitude that was wrong. Especially in your teenage years when you think you know everything and you're really brain dead until you're 25. I mean, you know, and just one wrong attitude. Mom, Dad say this, and you're rah, 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 rah. That's enough. You're out of here. Law demands that you pay the penalty for that attitude. Right? So... We recognize through the law, that's the purpose of it, the law, the revelation of God via the law, is in fact one that we needed to show us what was wrong so that we could see our helplessness and be justified by faith. Go to verse 25, please. But after that faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So I start married to the law, but once I'm born again, I'm into or placed into another system. Another round of righteousness. Another means to righteousness. And this one, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I'll say it. This one gives me a position of righteousness and can actually affect my condition if I'll stay here. So I'm married to the law. Go to Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, please. Let's take a look at another witness. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made where? Even Jesus came and was subject to the law as a man. He didn't come and violate God's word. He came and kept it. The only man in attitude and action for 33 and a half years that never violated any aspect of God's law. Amazing. That's why he qualifies as the sacrifice. That's why he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world because he did that. So he was born under the law. Next verse. To redeem them that were, where? So who did he come to redeem? Us. Who did he come to redeem? Us. For God so loved the... Earth. So the whole world was <coughs> under the law. Are you getting it? Yes. So relative to righteousness, on the subject of righteousness, you were born married to the law. 
And it could not affect your position. And it could not give you a changed condition. It can only speak to you about God's holiness and leave you without the ability to change yourself. It can only leave you in the need for a Savior. So you are under the dominion of the law and you're trapped there because as long as you are alive and the law ain't going nowhere. As long as you are alive, the law has dominion over you. Let's go back to our text. Remember in verses 2 and 3, chapter 7, death changes, changes Relationship. Now look at verse 4. Romans 7 and 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. The moment that you were born again, the moment that you exhibited faith in the schoolmaster that you needed, the, 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 not the schoolmaster, and into Christ, the, the schoolmaster led you to Christ. The moment you said yes to Jesus... You were united with Him. In the mind of God, Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Him. Guess what happens when you're crucified? Guess what happens when you're crucified? Guess what happens when you're crucified? You die. And guess what death does? Death changes your relationship to your first husband, the law. Do you see it? Death changes your first relation. So you are dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why? So that you can be married. Yes. See, if you were already married and there is no death, to be married again is illegal. But through the mind of God's redemption plan to free you from the authority of the law, the demands of the law, and the penalty of the law, He gives you Christ, and in His wonderful, powerful plan, full of wisdom and prudence, He legally separates you from the legal demands of the law, and now makes you accountable to Christ, and not the law. Really? Yeah. Woo! This is good stuff. You have been freed. Listen, you've been freed from the authority of your first husband, and you've been joined because there has been a death. Now here, you need to know, those of you that know the law, the law has dominion over you as long as you live. But now you need to understand, I'm no longer being held accountable to law as the means of righteousness. I have left that system, and I've been planted into a whole new system. And this system gives me a position of righteousness, and this system of grace and faith, not law, but grace and faith, grants me the ability to have my condition being changed. I'm being conformed because I'm no longer married to the law. I'm now married to Christ. And the idea is, being married to Christ, I can now bring forth fruit unto God. Because grace can do for you what law can never do. Grace can do for you what rules and religion can never do. Grace can do for you, not just give you a position of righteousness, which is where the grace revolution is stopping. They say, oh, just get saved and you're already sanctified. I got news for you. If I come home and live with you for a week, I'm going to find out that you ain't sanctified as much as you should be, and you're going to find out that I'm not as sanctified as you thought I was. <laughs> come on, I'm not, I'm, am I talking to humanity? Because this process of sanctification has to be carried out line upon line, precept upon precept, issue by issue, and it is an impossibility for you to be conformed into the image of Christ when you're still embracing the thoughts and tenets of the old revelation of God, the law. You've got to come into the full understanding of how faith and grace works so that you maintain your position and your condition is constantly being changed. Yes. Now, here's where i got to hurry with this. How long have I been talking? About a half an hour. Okay. Um, maybe, let's see, you don't have service tonight, do you? No. 
No problem. No problem. All right. Just kidding. Just kidding. I saw the panic on your face. Because listen, I could teach this for I'm six weeks and I still wouldn't. Here's what I need you to see. A couple of things. I'm going to say this and I hope that you can, I hope that you can get it. The law, again, was God's revelation. It, it, there's never, listen, there's never anything wrong with the law. Amen. Paul would say it's righteous and holy and good. Uh, go to, in the scriptures, please, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. First Timothy 1, verse 8. We know that the law is good. Now Paul's writing to Christians. If a man use it lawfully. Now let's slow down a second here. That means that there is an appropriate use of the law for the Christian. Even after being exited from this system. There's still <clears throat> truth in the law that still is truth Amen. today. When Jesus said, or when God gave the revelation of the Ten Commandments, He said, don't kill. Well, just because you're in a new system, is God no longer saying that? <laughs> is God saying it's okay to kill? No, He's not. So you're still made aware of right and wrong through what the Bible says. So after you're saved, you don't throw out the moral code of God. Because it was God's revelation to you and to all mankind as to what's right and wrong. The, the discussion in our country about is homosexuality, homosexual activity right or wrong has already been declared in the Old Testament. It's clear. It's declared again in the New. Homosexuality is not an alternative lifestyle. It's a sin in the mind of God. It's clear. It's right there. It's right there. It just because we're born again doesn't mean that God now accepts homosexuality. Just because we're born again doesn't mean that God now accepts adultery. So the law can be used lawfully if we let it define right from wrong. But we must not allow it to be the means by which we obtain or maintain righteousness. Are you following this? And I'm going to explain this in a little bit more. Go to the next verse. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. The main purpose of the law is not... To convict me of sin because I've already been convicted of sin. But the world out there needs to be convicted of sin. I'm not thinking that the Ten Commandments on the lawn of the courthouse is going to get you further along in your sanctification. I'm thinking the Ten Commandments on the, on the steps of the courthouse is going to bring conviction to the lost person out there. And I say yes and amen. Yes, let's use the law for what it was designed to. Let's convict men of sin. Let's figure out and know what's right and what's wrong. But see, God had always, always determined that the law as his revelation would come to an end. Because it was an incomplete or lesser revelation than he wanted men to have of himself. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. Galatians 3 and 19. And she's putting it on the board, doing a great job. Paul asked the question, what's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression. It was added to reveal to men transgression till, stop, till the law was God's revelation of righteousness till. Till. That means that the law as God's revelation to man was going to end at a certain point of time. Why? Because there was a seed Amen. that was coming. The seed that was coming. Who was the seed? Jesus was the seed. So the law was until the seed should come. Go on, your, go on the screen to Luke 16, 16. 
Let me put this together for you. I'll try to wind it up in the next half an hour, 45, three hours, whatever. <laughs> Don't panic. I won't do that to you. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Why does it, why does it why? The law and the prophets were God's revelation of man unto man and about righteousness until John. What, why, why, why John? Because John is the one that stood on the banks of the Jordan and said, let me introduce you to the greatest revelation of the Father that you'll ever get. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let me introduce you to the new revelation. The one that was promised, the Messiah, the seed that was going to come and replace the law as the revelation of God to humanity. Amen. Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't eliminate the law. He didn't abolish the law. He swallowed up the truths of the law and now they're found in him. Okay, God's first revelation wasn't wrong. It was not incorrect, incorrect. So we don't look at it and say it's, 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 it no longer matters. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. What Jesus did was take the law and absorb it into himself. But you need to understand that he is a greater revelation of God to humanity than the law ever could be. And I'll explain that a little bit more. Are you getting this? The law was until John. And now its authority as the revelation of God is no longer what it used to be. Because we have a greater yes. revelation. Go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. You get it? God revealed himself by the law and the prophets. Am I boring you? Okay. By the law and the prophets unto the fathers, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Jesus becomes the revelation of God that goes beyond right and wrong and introduces us to a relationship with God that you could never have under the law. Teaches us about the Father in a way that the law could never teach us. So now when the Son comes, He absorbs the law into Himself, but He is a greater revelation of righteousness than the law ever could be. Again, the law could not provide me with righteousness, but Jesus can provide me with righteousness. He can provide me with the position and he can provide me with the condition. So when Jesus comes, the law is not demolished. It's absorbed into the person of Christ. Listen, and now when we accept Christ, he not only teaches us God's moral code, but he teaches us how to treat one another and he teaches us how to worship. He teaches us and gives us power over the strength of sin and gives us the ability to rise in our condition above sin and weight that would so easily beset us. You got you a brand new system, folk. You got a new revelation of how to get righteous. No longer under the law through what you do, but righteousness by faith in Christ. And because of what he's done now, I can have a position of righteousness. And because he sent back the Holy Spirit to break the powers of darkness and live inside of me, I have the law written into the firm firmament of my heart. That's not an elimination of the law. It's an absorption of the law. Christ is a greater revelation. He said to Philip, he said, when you've seen me, because Philip said, show us God. Show us the Father. And Jesus said, when you saw me, have I been so long with you, Philip? And you don't get it? When you see me, I'm the revelation of God to you. Don't you know that, Philip? And when you see me, you've seen the Father. We watched how the Father as a man would act, how he would deal with people, how he would heal, how he would raise up, how he would not condemn but save. We watched the revelation of the Father in the life of Jesus. If you want to know the Father, you can look at the revelation of Christ in Jesus. Look at Christ revealing the Father to us. 
The law could never give you that. The law couldn't reveal God to you. And the law sure, sure couldn't do anything but force you to pay the penalty. And it couldn't free you from the sin nature. So Christ comes along. He's a greater revelation. He's a greater revealer. He empowers us to live this Christian life. Now, instead of law written on stone, there's law written in our hearts. And wait a minute. I said it's a greater revelation, so it also means that the revelation of what's right has got to go a little bit further than the law did. Jesus would teach it. He said, you heard them say of old, in the old revelation under the law, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, in my kingdom of righteousness, that you shall not hate one another. Yeah. See, under the old, all you had to do was not pull the trigger. You could hate until the sun went down. But under the new, if there's somebody you don't like, you better fix it. I said, you better fix it. And you can't fix it by yourself, and the law can't fix it, but the one that came to reveal the Father can send the power of the Holy Ghost and change your heart about how you feel about somebody. You better fix it. The Bible said, the old law said, the revelation of God said, thou shalt not kill. I said, you shall not hate. The law said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, see what is he doing? It's a greater revelation of righteousness. Why? Because he gives us not just a greater revelation of righteousness, he gives us the means to righteousness. Oh, yeah. You get imputed righteousness by faith, and your condition gets him changed by faith. If you're struggling with lust and, and overwhelmed by websites you shouldn't be, there's a way to overwhelm that power by faith in Christ and what he did. You can't get it, freedom from it by the law. You can only get freedom from it by grace and faith. Yeah. Under the new economy, under the greater revelation of God in Christ. Yeah. You see it? So what do I do with the law? I recognize it as a revelation of God to humanity. I recognize it as that, insti in, uh, that the institution that gave us right from wrong. But I also recognize that the law never went far enough. It didn't address the inward working of man, just the external. Amen. And the law couldn't save. Romans 8 and 3. Put that up on the screen for me. Romans 8 and 3 and 4. And, and uh, forgive me for giving you so much scripture, but I'm trying to give you something that you'll walk out of here with. And, and we are recording, right? Or taping or something. So you can get this and think about it again because you're going to need to. Yeah. Romans chapter 8 and 3. Look, for what the law could not do, See, the initial revelation of God, the first revelation of God, couldn't do something. But in that it was weak through the flesh. It could tell us right from wrong, but could give us no power to keep it. Could give us no power to carry it out. But God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh in our form and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, verse 4, how do you do that? By the cross, watch, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here's the point. You get imputed righteousness, which says God sees you as a law keeper, but God doesn't stop here. I don't care what anybody says to you. Don't fall for it. Don't just sit still. Your condition needs to be changed by grace and faith, just like your position was changed by grace and faith. And the righteousness of the law is to be seen in your everyday life. God still says be ye holy as I am holy yeah. now when you falter and you stumble and you fail not with, not if yeah. when then ask God to forgive you get back up you haven't lost you haven't lost your position you haven't lost your salvation because that's established not by what you do by what you believe if you keep believing, he'll take you through this process and he'll fulfill the righteousness of the law in you, those of you that are trusting in him and not in yourself. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Christ is the greater revelation of the Father to humanity. Yes. It doesn't eliminate what the law said. 
that's absorbed into Christ. And even a greater demand, a higher demand under grace is now placed on you because the Holy Spirit lives in you and the law of God is written in your heart. Honey, you can't get away with nothing. You ever sneak away from your family so they don't see what you do? I'm going to watch this and they can't see it. Well, come on now. Don't, 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 don't. I see angels, wings, and halo. <laughs> Have you ever had to get away because you're afraid you're, they're going to criticize? They're going to say, oh, don't do it, right? And you know you shouldn't, but you're going to anyway. Am I in the right place this morning? <laughs> you can't get away from Christ. No, yeah. You can't get away from the Holy Ghost. He lives on the inside of every born-again believer. The law of God is written on the tablets of your heart. And the minute, see this is a greater revelation of righteousness. That doesn't just give you a greater revelation of righteousness. It gives you the means, the position, and the power to affect your condition. So now you can't get away with nothing. Amen. Amen. Busted. <laughs> now you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can crush the Holy Spirit. You can... <laughs> defile God's word, you can push it away, but there are dire consequences to that. You might not lose your soul, but the wages of sin still brings death to the believer and non-believer alike. So we're moving forward now no longer operating by law. Law means I will, I do, I will work through this. You can't do it that way. That was what you were born under. But now you become dead to the law by the body of Christ so that you could bring forth fruit, proper action, proper attitude unto God. And you don't bring it forth through fasting and prayer and Bible study and church attendance. It's brought forth from you by faith, by abiding in Christ, by trusting in Him. Ooh, Romans 7 verse 5. Can we back up one verse? Just get a run and start at it. Wherefore, my brethren, you're dead to the law. But that doesn't mean we ignore the righteous requirements of the law. The righteous requirements of the law have been absorbed into Christ. Now I'm in Christ. And the book of Hebrews says, and Jeremiah prophesied, that under the new covenant which you're a part of, the law of God would be written into the tablet of your heart. And the law and the and Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit as a result of Calvary to live on the inside of us, and he will guide you into all truth. You can't get away with nothing. Alright? We become dead to the law by the body of Christ, so we may be married to him who is raised from the dead. Obviously, Christ is our new husband. And now, under this new plan, we're to bring forth fruit unto God. Now verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. If you're a believer and you're trying to sanctify yourself by what you do instead of by simple faith in what Christ has done at Calvary and what Christ can do in you by grace, then you're trying to Marry a second husband. The old husband. You buried him. Now you dig him up and bring him home. Stick him in the bed with you. Ooh. Ooh. That's how God looks at it. Because the law had its purpose. And even in part is in Christ, absorbed in Christ. But that's not the means of righteousness. You can't have Jesus and the law in the same bed. That makes you an adulterer. You're married to Christ. To totally depend upon Him. Not upon yourself. Not upon what you do. Not upon your effort. Not upon your works. But to totally rely on Him. Who He is and what He did. He's the righteousness of God. Revealed to humanity. Offering you a righteous standing and giving us the potential of righteous condition by faith in who He is and what He's done. So verse 5 simply says, 
We could, we only brought forth, if you go back that right, you're going to find death. That's what Romans 7 is all about. Don't go back to the law as the means of righteousness, but we use the law lawfully. In other words, we recognize that the commandments of God are not abrogated. They're in fact expanded upon. Oh, we don't have to keep the Sabbath day. Why? Because our rest is now in Christ. Yeah. We don't have to work the law. Why? Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. See? And because we have been freed from the law, the righteousness of the law can be fulfilled in us, the condition, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit and our reliance upon Him. And when we fail in this learning process, God doesn't throw us away. He says, get back up. Ask me to forgive you. I'm just and faithful. I'll cleanse you and we'll keep moving forward. But whatever you do, don't go back and dig up your first husband. Plop him up in the bed with you and say, free me from my problem. Because he couldn't deliver you before. He can't deliver you now. You've been freed from Him. Stay true to Jesus. And if you do, verse 6. But now, now, we are delivered from the law as the means of righteousness. Its authority and its penalty have no power over me. Amen. I'm delivered from that. Yeah. That's not what God uses as a standard of righteousness. Christ has become wisdom and righteousness yeah. to me. Yeah. Christ is my righteousness. I'm unrighteous in Christ. And if with my faith in Christ, He not only gives me that position, but that can, I'm saying that a ton of times because repetition is your best teacher. You need that position that faith in Christ can bring. And you need that condition change that only faith in Christ can bring. Yeah. And I'm no longer held by that first marriage to the law. So that now I can serve my Christ, my Jesus, in the newness of the Spirit. Wow! What's that mean? That means now it's no longer I that live, Amen. but Christ that lives in me. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. life that I now live, I live by the faith yeah. of the Son of God who loves me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God by digging up my old husband and counting on him. I am married to faith and grace and faith must be in him and what he did. The cross is the means, the road, the way to the source and I see it for what it is. I don't worship the cross, but I know it as the way. I know it as the means to the source. And so I say, thank you, Jesus, for the cross. My faith is in what you did at Calvary to cut covenant so that now I can access the source and the source can send the Holy Spirit through the cross back to me. He lives in me and he can defeat the powers of darkness as my faith is in the one who provided this for me. So now I work, I live, I breathe in the newness of the Spirit because the cross was the means and Christ is the source and all of that's available to me and I don't short circuit by thinking I can when I never could in the first place. But I can by faith. For by grace are you saved. Through faith, the great word saved, sozo, means to be healed, protected, delivered, made whole. Do you need healing today? Do you need protection today? Do you need deliverance today? Do you need to be made whole? Do you need transformation today? Well, it only comes by faith and grace. And faith has to be in the person who opened up the way, and the way was the cross. So faith in Christ and the cross gets you made whole, gets you delivered, sealed, protected. Amen. Amen. Nothing else will. And you can serve Him in the newness of the Spirit. His Spirit will help you, fall through you. You'll get up to say one thing, and the Holy Ghost will say, uh -huh, and you'll change what you're supposed to say. Can I, can I get a witness? Amen. The rest of you are going to get saved. If you never had that happen, it'll happen. Because the Spirit lives inside of you. He's there to guide you. He's there to promote righteousness in you. He's not there to let you say, oh, I'm under grace and now it doesn't matter. Oh, I don't need to confess my sin because I failed. No, 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 a thousand times no. 
He's there to take us to the woodshed every time we fail, but also to express to us the mercy, compassion, and pity of God and the assurance that the blood still cleanses and what God has cleansed, let no man call unclean. So I get back up clean by the blood of Jesus, trusting in my new husband to bring me through to the fullness of my position and my condition. And I don't get lulled back into relationship with the law. I don't get back into the oldness of the letter because that revelation of God has been absorbed into the new revelation. The law was until the seed should come and the seed has come giving us a greater revelation of who God is and what holiness is and what righteousness is. And now he lives inside of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. And I serve him not in the oldness of the letter, but in the newness of the Spirit. <clears throat> Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you're tired and you're thirsty, there is freedom. If you're tired and you're thirsty, there is freedom. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face There is freedom Freedom reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face, there is freedom. The message in tongues and interpretation was the Lord saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. He alone can do in us and for us and to us what we need. And there's no weight and there's no sin that can't be forgiven and overcome. And we are not to walk in condemnation, but we are to press for righteousness through faith in Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. Would you stand with me this morning? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you need it this morning, just reach out and take it by faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, if you need a change in your heart and your life, take it. There is freedom. If you know the song, worship with me. Where have you Tired and you're weary, there is freedom. If you're tired and you're weary, there is freedom. Jesus will give it to you. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and Falling on every face, there is freedom. Lord, we submit every issue to you today, every single issue of our lives that needs to be changed, every single habit, every single idiosyncrasy, we submit to you today in the name of Jesus.
And Lord, as we come to you by faith, repenting of our failure, but accepting your provision for our life and life more abundant, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'll do what you say you will do. For you are not the son of man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should repent. Lord, we believe you today that every single issue in these lives, when we're approaching those issues by faith and grace, by faith in Christ and what he did for us through the cross, that those issues are going to be resolved. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace falling on every face. There is freedom. There is freedom. If you believe it, give the Lord a hand clap of praise.